Good morning, everyone. Let's not waste time and get right to it. We're in the series of how to think, and we're going to be continuing from where we were last week, but let's pray. Father, I thank you today in the name of Jesus for these words. May we come with a teachable spirit to learn what you have for us today. May it transform our thinking so we are renewed in our minds. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. As we have established throughout this series, our issues tend to increase the more that we get out of the Word of God. The more that we start replacing the Word of God with every and any and all things other than the Word, we start to see the issues that we have in society. We can easily begin to see the mental disorders that they call that are creeping in, and that is because of where we are. When there is no word that is life being spoken, what do we think will happen? You see, life and death is in the power of the tongue. And so if there is no life being spoken and only death, well, then those are seeds of death that will be coming forward. Positive thinking only works so long as that is what is there. But it's very evident by, by society that that is not enough to be sustainable. Only it is the Word of God. And so we have a lot of work to do to come back to a place of understanding how to think. It is not by accident that we are not taught how to think, nor how to learn. Many universities today have courses that are called critical thinking. Although they don't really teach how to think, they tell the students what to think. In my particular courses, I don't care what the students think, I want to know how they derived that position and arrived at such conclusion. Whether or not I agree is not as relevant as the fact that they learned how to think to get themselves there. The more that we are away from God's word, the less we understand the things of God, the less that we understand about life, the less we value it, the less we really are knowing how to utilize our brains that God has given us. It is estimated that we're only using 10% of our brains. So that means that 90% is being wasted. So what are you thinking about? Are you thinking on these things or these things? So where we left off last week, we left off in the book of Joshua in chapter 1, where Joshua was told to be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Now, I want to take you there for a moment because I want to show you something else in this. That if you start to see this, you'll see the very importance of the Old Testament. I posed the question last week, where in Scripture does it say we do no longer need the Old Testament? But I want to show you something, okay? Look at this. And this is something that the young people today need to hear, okay? And just under, understand these scriptures because it's so very important. Now, in Joshua 1, 6, yes, we know that this is the Lord speaking to Joshua. I get that. That is the context. So it is written, be strong and of good courage. For unto this people shall divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their forefathers to give them. Now, I'm believing God for ministry property. We need a lot of acres, a, a lot. Actually, it's quite more than what you might even think to realize, but I'm believing God for it. This is, this is part of what needs to be done. But when I read this here, an inheritance for the land, there's always an issue with land when you really start to look around. The land grabs, the land, the land, the land. But as I continue, only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, for thou mayest prosper whither, whither soever thou goest. Now in 7, in NIV, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Imagine young people getting into the book of Proverbs and really reading it every day. I know people that have become millionaires, and how do they do it? By reading a proverb every day. 
So we start to see the value of that, right? We're turning not to the left. We're turning not not to to the right, but we're looking at success. Do you not think that what's in the Bible would be good for young people to know, even out of the scripture? But then it says, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. So success does not come before this. Okay. Now what's interesting is that the only time success comes before work is in the dictionary. But, you know, many people just want the perks without the works. They want to show up and get a trophy, which is one of the greatest disservices that we've done to young people because by the time they get to college, they just expect they're going to get an A because they just submitted something. Well, you didn't even submit the correct assignment. Right, but that doesn't matter. This is what I submitted, so therefore I'm entitled. Well, no, actually hold your horses there. That's not quite how it works. Maybe in the peanut gallery over there, but not here. Same thing for us in the body of Christ. We just think, well, I showed up. So because I'm here and I decree it so that you owe me. Well, no, you got to be careful and be obedient to do everything in it. And then you will be prosperous and successful. If you do nothing, what do you, what is God, where, where would God bless the hands, your hands, if they do nothing? Have I not commanded you? Now, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Okay, now let me just demonstrate this. Um, so, the Lord is with you wherever you go. He's telling, this is being told to Joshua. Now, let me just break this down. The Lord can't not be with you because he is I am and God operates outside of time. He is the holder of time. All of the earth is God's and everything that is in it is his. So if you are in it and you are with him and he is in you and you're the Holy Spirit and dwells within you, then uh, you have absolutely nothing to be terrified of. Unless, of course, you're being disobedient, then I would really then start to question. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So, God's with you. God's got this. Like, what, what's the issue? The issue tends to just be separate from God. Most issues you have are not God issues. Most issues you have are you, <laughs> within you. It has nothing to do with God. God gave you peace. Why are you not living in it? Well, because of the world. So, why is the world holding over you, telling you how to feel. Like, who's mastering your emotions? If you're mastered by macaroni, you need to wake up. See, we can start to look at a lot of these things that make absolutely no sense. Well, you know, there's so much doom and gloom, right? And why is it controlling how you feel? Well, you know, it's, it's cloudy out, so therefore, what? So what, the weather's now controlling you? Really? No, it's mindset. It's a mindset. Everything is moving through a power of illusion of power and an illusion of control to keep you molded into being a little bot on this earth, drinking the fluoride-filled water, having no thoughts, living in your little eye life, drinking your gin as you buy on Amazon, which, by the way, gin, gin drinkers are known to spend more money than scotch or whiskey drinkers. Funny how that works, but there was a study completed about that because they wanted to know who buys the most. Not the wine drinkers, not the beer drinkers, but gin drinkers spend the most money on Amazon. Maybe it's the gin that has the impact, I don't know. But bottom line here is when people are falling into this and not thinking, then how are you going to be sober, mind, and alert? If you're not even aware of what's happening around you, then um, wake up. Wake up. People want to want to say there's no such thing as as and gaslight us about there's no inflation really. Price of eggs has gone up sixty three percent. The price of sugar has gone up even more so and will continue. The price of chocolate is is increasing. That's why I'm learning how to grow my own chocolate because that's a that is a big deal in this household. Let me just say this compound over here, this palace, we need some good chocolate. Not not no. We don't do we don't do bad. We do good. So. We have to learn some things and have a clue to wake up of what's happening all around us. Hannah 
got a clue, okay? How do we know this? Because she delivered her son Samuel to the temple to be dedicated to God. Okay, so she got a clue. She was bitter in herself, got a clue, released it, which would make sense because how many, if you are, if you are ready to give birth and bitter, well, bitterness rots the bones. So now we got to release that so we can get our thinking in the correct place. So she dedicated her son to God as she promised God that she would do if he blessed her with a son. What covenants have you entered into with God? What have you bound yourself to? I have a covenant that God goes way back and it is all written out. It is a covenant. There are, there are 12 elements in it that will not be broken. And, and that is how that is. A lot of times we don't really, we don't really value covenants anymore. How do we know this? Look at the divorce rate in the church is just as high outside the church. If we value covenants, we would be treating everything with a lot more respect than what we do. So she offered a prayer dedication. Why? Because she knew who and understood who God was. So turn with me to the book of Isaiah. Okay, I'm going to show you this. When you start to understand who God is, that God is not your Pez dispenser, you will honor him in a different way. And the reason why we have such foolery going on in our nations is because of so many movements that, well, I don't need a man. I can cook my own bacon, fry it in a pan. Great. Yes, we all know that. But why? Why is that it? I don't need you to open up the door for me. Well, I appreciate the door being open because I do not want to break a nail. I'm just saying. Somebody wants to open up the door. I am all about that. Yes, thank you very much. You know why? Because men are men, and there are good men everywhere that still operate with the level with the level of chivalry. Now, is it women that killed it? Certainly, because now women are priding themselves on demonstrating that they're capable when everybody already knows it. Hello, we don't we don't need a feminist movement to demonstrate how capable we are that we can walk, clean, and cook. It's already known, right? The, 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 the Proverbs woman in Proverbs 31 demonstrated that and then some and didn't need to be mean, bitter, and angry in her quest for her femininity. She just was a godly woman who had it much harder than any woman on the earth today. Much, much harder. And she still thrived in a man's world. So we don't need to beat men down to be women. We can just be women on the earth. And Hannah got a clue who God was. When you start to get a clue who God is, then you can just rest in the fact that he's God. And you don't have to compete with him. And you don't have to fight with him. And you don't have to show your big ego. See, your ego is one of two. You're either edging God out or edifying God only. It is your choice. When you edify God only, you'll be moving away from your ego and moving more like Hannah. In the book of Isaiah chapter 2, starting in verse 2, listen to this. Let me see here. Actually, it's not, it's not Isaiah. I miswrote this. I need to learn how to read my own writing. I thought this seemed a little bit weird she would be in Isaiah. She's not. Go to 1 Samuel. I put eyes... It looks, my ones look like an eye, so I needed somebody to translate my writing for me. I will get there, and it's a good thing that I do know at least the scripture. So I got that going for me, if there's anything going for me. That is that. Now, all right. Now we're making sense. Some of you are like, she don't know what she's talking about. Give me a second, and I will, I will figure and sort myself out. But look at this. We'll just start in verse 1. And Hannah prayed, 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 2, and Hannah prayed. Okay, right there, mindset, okay, right there. It is estimated that in the Western world, Christians pray five minutes a day. What do you think is going to happen in that five minutes? You get a good parking spot and then what? How about the rest of your family? Are they born again? How's your children? Are they, are they confused, castrating themselves while, while they're playing Fortnite, while they're playing Stellar? What, what do they got going on? Do they even talk to you? Do you even know? Where are they? What's happening in their lives? There's so many things to be praying about that, that we got to like, wake up to that. So Hannah prayed, hallelujah, a praying woman. Now, if you are not praying, you can expect you will be prayed on. You better just know that because the devil is looking for whom he may devour. So how do I handle this in my life? I'm up before he is. And as soon as I'm up, he knows because he flees. 
because he's scared of me as he should be. Praise God. So, and Hannah prayed, hallelujah, and said, my heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. What a beautiful prayer by this woman of God. What a beautiful prayer. There is none holy as the Lord. Amen and amen. For there is none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so exceedingly proud. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge and by him actions are weighed. Now see, we pride ourselves, well, I know this and I, yeah, okay. People don't care how much you know. They'll know when you show how much you care. I mean, it's amazing how many times I say something to people and they just, they just bypass. I'm like, I'm crying out for help and you guys, nobody's getting it. They're just not even, not even hearing the cry not for years. Nobody, just like, do we not get, do we, we just don't know how to listen or like we're just stuck on self. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. It was a very, very tough season many years ago. For the Lord is a God of knowledge and by him actions are weighed. This is why when we start to look at the behavior of people, that's, that, that's a fallacy because their behavior is, is not the issue. It's a symptom of an issue. What's the issue? A heart issue. It's a heart issue. Something's not right with the heart. When people want to commit suicide, what's the issue? Oh, well, they, they need medication. No, they don't. The medication's probably what got them. They're having the hallucinations. We'll go back to 19, actually, we'll go back to 1872 and in 1820 or 1720 in a few messages down the line. But here, that, that, that doesn't solve the problem. We got to come back to seeing the behavior is symptomatic of the bigger issue. It's always a spiritual issue. What you think, how you think, the words, your behavior, thoughts, as soon as the thoughts always come back to something spiritual. But God looks at the actions. There's something behind the action that God is interested. Now, we also know in what 2 Samuel 16, 7, that man looks at outward appearance. So you start judging people. Well, yeah, you're judging by their actions, not recognizing that actions are symptomatic of something else. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumble are girdeth with strength. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren hath borne seven, and she that hath many children is waxed feeble. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave, and he bringeth up. Verse 7, the Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raised up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he hath set the world upon them. Now, I want to go back and I want to read this to you in the NIV because it reads a little bit different. There is none holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Do not keep talking so proudly or let your mouth speak such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows, and by him deeds are weighed. The bows of the warrior are broken, but those who stumble are armed with strength. For those who were full hire themselves out for food, but those who were hungry hunger no more. She who was barren is born seven children, but she who has many sons pines away. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and has, has them inherit a throne of honor. Notice that it, that it is he that humbles and exalts. It is God Many, many of you are trying to just make it happen. You're the rainmaker. You're this, you're that. Operating in the world status. You got to do this. You got to do that. Really? Just simmer down. Chill out. Let God move. 
All you have to do is look at God and God does it. The problem is that we don't look at God. We do it, get tired. It doesn't work the way we want. Blame God and get mad and then live miserable. It's all backwards, which society is backwards. It's chaotic. God first. Now you want to know what happened with Hannah? Oh, God blessed her. Not only did God God bless her, but he gave her he gave her three more sons and two daughters. How about that? See, God is a God that when we surrender, we get it. There was someone in in my adoptive family that wanted a, a another baby and for many, many, many years did the in vitro and and then gave up. And guess what happened when they gave up? They got pregnant. See, sometimes you just need to give up. Now, you say, well, I can't quit. I'm not. Quitting and giving up are two different things. When you give up you, <laughs> God can work. We're not quitting God. We're giving up ourselves. Two very different things. Most people don't want to give up themselves. They just want to be more full of themselves and drag God along for a little amen that makes them look good. And then they just sound off like they're so great when it's all farce. So we're getting out of all the religious piousness and all of the shenanigans over there to recognize and we, when we come to the surrender, when we get that God is God, Hannah dealt with her bitterness and God blessed her mightily. When we stop looking around, well, they have this and they have this, so what? When you get to the full place, let me tell you the best place that you could ever be is when, when you are so full with your own life that you're not, that you don't want what anybody else has. I look around a lot. There's a lot of, there's a lot to look at. I don't want what the people have. Mm -mm. I want what I have. Because if I want what they have, one, I don't even know what they have. Too. It might just be dressed pretty, and then you take all the clothes off, and you're like, dang, I don't want that. Or the suit, whatever. You see you see it for what it really is. No, 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 I'm good. I'm good. I'm in this place where I have what I have, and may it be perfect. Well, God is perfect, so we can say amen. But are there, are there adjustments? Absolutely. But when we surrender that to God and we look and we focus on where we are with the things of God, we can start begin to see the awesomeness of how mightily blessed we are. Many of you have been spending your life looking and getting bitter about what other people have that you think that they aren't taking care of it. But yet, what are you taking care of in your own house if you're judging them, see? Now we got to reel that back in because the only thing that matters is you. You are the most important to God in your relationship with him. Now I want you to turn with me to the book of Job. I'm going to show you something. Now I already taught on this on this young man. I find him rather irritating to be honest with you, but he does have some little morsels here. That is young Elihu. I found that he just these 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 friends that Job had. Uh we're in Job chapter 36. These friends that Job had, I don't know. I mean, God bless Job for shutting up because I probably would have just had a few choice words and then some, and God is just good in what he did in the life of Job. Now, would I want Job's life? Oh, uh-uh, have you ever had a boil? Uh -uh. And then, and then, and then, I often wonder, Lord, you took out everything, but his wife, you, you left him the wife, like really, of all the things, you left him the unruly, mouthy wife, really, like, come on, now, is that just not a sense of humor, like, here, you married her, you keep her, <laughs> like, wow, that's just, mm. I always wonder about that one, what, but, you know what, yeah, there's some lessons that, uh, that uh, she needed to see too, and, and, uh, I, 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 just God bless Job, but in chapter 36, look at this. So, this is Elihu, okay? Now, he's young. And this is why, this is why before I get into this, you got to really know to whom you're speaking to about what. People that are not where you are or have been where you are, don't talk to them about what you're going through because they will, that it doesn't matter of age. Because many people think, 
And I'm going to camp out here for a minute. Many people think, oh, well, they've gone to church for 40 years. They know something. No, they don't. They just know how to go to church. Do the math on that. It's still, it, they're still not even halfway of being an expert. So if you take going to church for 40 years, never missing, because I've had this conversation with somebody. Well, I got to church for 40 years. Okay. So 40 years, we do the math, 40, 40, 40 years, 52. Do, do the math on that. We'll just say it's an hour sermon. We'll give them that, not the 15 minute church. So we give them that. It still is not even halfway to being an expert. What's an expert? 10,000 hours on a subject. So length of years does not determine your expertise in something. It just means you've known how to go somewhere. That's all that's been established, okay? So when we start to look at this, if you are going places in the Lord, you need to be finding the people that have been there, that are tried, true, and tested. The people beneath or that are following after cannot help you get there. So if you talk to them, they will do nothing but blab out of their mind. They'll give you their own opinion that you probably didn't ask for, and they will prove to be ill-equipped, ill-advised, because they don't know. It's nothing against them. You just have to not engage because it will be more of a nightmare for you because you will have to explain to them and they can't get it because they've never been there. There's a hierarchy. There's apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, and pastors for a reason. If you're dealing with something, there's, there's levels and there's, there's spiritual maturity so recognize that, okay? So I'm giving this a little preface because Elihu, God bless the brother, but he didn't know what he didn't know, but he does know this. So I will give him the grace and the mercy and I will, I will give you this, that he tells of the justice of God, which is something we need to hear, the justice and the mercy of God. But in all these other things, people just like to talk about what they think. Well, great if it's asked for. Now, in 36.5, check this out. This is what he says. Behold, God is mighty and despiseth not any. He is mighty in strength and wisdom. Amen. He preserveth not the life of the wicked, but giveth right to the poor. We may say amen. He would draweth not his eyes from the righteous. Correct, because God's, the, the God's eyes are always on the righteous. Now, the righteous are believers, but not all believers are righteous. So don't get it twisted. Don't, well, they go to church. Still an atheist. So what? Still a pedo. So they go to church on Sunday. Okay. And, oh, holy man of God, because he goes to church. Where's the fruit? I don't care where the beef is. I want to know where the fruit is. Where's the fruit? So he, he would draw not his eyes from the righteous, but with kings are they on the throne. Yeah, he doth establish them forever and ever, and they are exalted. And if they be, be bound in fetters and be holden in cords of affliction, then he shew with them their work and their transgressions that they have exceeded. He openeth also their ear to discipline and commanded that they return from iniquity. If they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. But if they obey not, they shall perish by the sword and they shall die without knowledge. Many people like to say, what is it out of Jose? My people perish for lack of knowledge. Uh, yeah, what's the rest of it? Because you rejected the knowledge, I reject you. You got to finish the verse. See, so they die from lack of knowledge because they rejected. If you reject it, well, guess what? You're going to die of ignorance. Hello? Right? right? So, so we see here. Now, if I go into an NIV just for a moment, 35, 6, 36, 5, God is mighty, but does not despise men. Recognize that because the devil and the devil's kids want to, oh, God just hates you. God just hates you and God hates everyone because look at society. Never mind the wicked are doing wicked things, blaming God. He is mighty and firm in his purpose. God is not wishy-washy. God is not a woke, flaming retard. He just is not. God is God, firm. God is God. God is, God is not just on whatever side that fits him, that gets him the most votes. He's, he's righteous. He does not keep the wicked alive, but gives the afflicted their rights. Yes. I don't know what your rights are. Many of you are giving up your rights for privileges. 
It's two different things. Your rights are, your, there's a difference between a right and a privilege. Your government does not give you the privilege to exist. You have a right by God. You got to know your inalienable rights given by God. You got to know the constitution in America. You got to know what these things mean. God has given you the afflicted, the rights. He does not take his eyes off the righteous. He thrones them and thrones them with kings and exalts them forever. Praise God. But if men are bound in chains, held fast by cords of affliction, he tells them what they've done. So if you are bound by affliction, uh, the only place you need to go is before God. Why? So you can find out what the issue is. Why am I afflicted? What's up with this affliction? Because my Bible tells me one thing. Well, it tells me many things, but if people go, well, by your stripes, you're healed. Yeah. What do you need the healing for in the first place? What is the cause of the sickness in the first place? It's because they drink the water. Really? Don't buy it. I don't buy that at all. That's an excuse. Sure, there's, okay, well, blah, blah, blah. Yes, there's always that. Not arguing that. My point here is that, is that men are bound in chains. There's a reason. Most men are bound in chains because this is being wiped off the face of the earth. This is why more people are bound in chains because they're rejecting the word of God. They're rejecting God. You think you're not going to be bound? If you reject God, mental disorders won't come upon you and your household. Hello. He tells them what they've done, that they have sinned. Not only have they sinned, but arrogantly. Like that's, that's no joke. That is no joke. God will rebuke. And I have been rebuked straight to my face by God. And let me just say, I, 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 I got straight quick. Straighter. Straight. He makes them listen to correction and commands them to repent of their evil. Yeah, that's right, God does. Why, I mean, if, but notice this, okay? He makes them listen to correction and, command, and correction and commands them to repent of their evil. Notice that he gives a command, but he also gave you free will. So just because the command is there, your choice to be obedient is on you. Hmm. Well, I don't think I sinned. It's not for you to think. <laughs> Therein lies the problem. Therein lies the problem that we have today. Many have just rebuked the past that apostles and prophets are not for today. Whenever there's correction brought forth to the body of Christ, well, who are you? I don't like your voice. I don't like this. I don't need this. This isn't for me. Well, you know what? You don't have to deal with yourself. You certainly don't. I mean, that's all up to you. God is the one that provides the way for it. And if it's received, then there's a blessing that comes through that. If not, well rot that's on you you just go be a wandering rebellious little person in the land that's fine but he still gave us free will if they obey and serve him if they will spend their days in prosperity the rest of their days in prosperity and their years in contentment so in contentment comes or in obedience comes contentment isn't it interesting when apostle paul says i know the secret of contentment in having much and having little hmm Hmm. You can have much and not be content. And you can have a little and be content. How is that? Obedience. You will be live in the years in obedience. So contentment is resting in obedience, is getting to the place of obedience to rest in it. Most discontent, miserable people are, are, are disobedient. They're also very self-centered and narcissistic. And most miserable people only look in the mirror and they never look beyond the mirror to do anything for anybody else. They just are self-centered. That's why they're miserable. Hello. You probably know. So maybe you're married to one. I don't know. If they do not listen, they will perish by the sword and die without knowledge. So this is a covenant. If you obey God and you serve him, then then you live in, the, in prosperity. You live in the contentment. It becomes easy. You want to know why? Because when you desire to be obedient, it's not at an obligation. It is because you love him. Do you love God? Do you love Jesus? See, when you get to that place, you come home because you desire that. You desire the greater thing. The way you once lived, you don't, des you, don't, you don't lust after who you once were in the flesh. Because now you desire him. 
it starts here that, Lord, I love you so much that I want everything about me to be honoring and pleasing to you. When you get to that place, let me tell you what will happen. That, that all the other stuff in the world will not consume you. Where people are won't be an inhibitor. It won't mean that, that, well, somebody needs to be broke for you to be rich or somebody needs to be angry and miserable for you to be happy. You just are. Because you're in a place that, that you worked to get to, not works-based, but you put yourself and you positioned yourself in this place with the Lord that nothing matters outside of you and your relationship with Him. Now, many of you may say, that's just a bubble of existence. Absolutely, and I love it. Because there is where peace is. There is where life is. There is where joy is. All the other stuff is the problems of the world that they create for themselves. So we have a duty to be getting ourselves right in our minds to be thinking correctly. Because when you get to this place of being all in with God, then it becomes who you are. Love becomes who you are. You're not bound by all these other things that, that are causing you to flip-flop. Wishy-washy, washy-wishy. Da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. You get past all that. You move out of religion. It's not looking around at what they're doing, what they have, and so-and-so-and-so-and-so. You don't care about the Joneses because you in who you are, are your standard with God. Turn with me to the book of Psalms 107. I'm going to show you this. Psalms 107. So we begin to see here our duty that's required by God. It's 107. I'm going to start. Is it 107? Let me see here. No, it's actually 103. It's uh, 103, 103.17, Psalm 103.17. Look at this. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children. To as such keep his covenant and to those that remember his commandments to do them. The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Hmm. Now, I'll read these two in the NIV, and then I'm going to move to some other Psalms. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him, and his righteousness with their children's children. So we're building up a legacy. You see, we look at the children of today. Why are they idiots? Well, look at the parents. Hello. And what happened to them? Look at their parents. So uh, we all are in this, in a positioning where everything by God is, is lineage. We're looking at a legacy here. With those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. Now turn with me to Psalm 119. And 119.1. Look at this. Blessed are the undefiled in the way and walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do not do iniquity. They walk in his ways. So, there are things that happen when we walk in the ways of God. We don't do iniquity. We stay blessed. We are moving in a way that that is the world. We don't want the stain and the stench of the world to, to taint us. 
You don't want that stain on your spirit, that stain on your soul. You want to be loosed from that. But in verse 4, what does it read? Thou hast commanded us to, to keep thy precepts diligently. Let me say, the key word here, the adverb, is, is diligently. It is your responsibility to, one, get yourself there and stay there. If you, if you, in order to get on the, on, on the course, you got to know there's a course and then you have to get to the course and then you got to stay on the course of a course, of course, because otherwise you won't see the white horse. Hmm. Now we're going into revelation, but you see this, see? So diligently, it's not a, it's not a once I did it and then that's it. That, that's not what we're doing. This is a lifestyle, not an event. When it becomes who you are, you are active in it. It is, it is who you are in demonstration of your life. You don't need to announce, yeah, I'm a Christian. Look at my fishy t-shirt to the dang on God that the Pope wears on his head. Okay. That's a demon. You start to see these things. You start to wake up and see all, all these little things all around, the symbolism, but it becomes who you are. The command has commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently, so we're doing it. They're to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. I will keep thy statutes, or forsake me not utterly. See, we're moving in a way to get that blessed are those whose ways are blameless by the determining of God, not us looking and judging. Because the Bible says, judge not lest ye be judged. We are moving in a way to be honoring God in all that we're doing. Why? Because one, we love him. Those who love and follow, those who follow his commands demonstrate their love for him. And because it's who we are. You start to see the difference between the Christians and, and the believers and the disciples. Very different people. The Christians, the believers, the disciples. You get to pick which you are. Three different groups of people. All operating in a very different way. Be not deceived. You get to choose, and it's demonstrated by the life that you live, not by what building you go to, not by how big bouffant hair you have or the ascot you wear or the car that you drive. It's not, it's not, it has, it has nothing to do with any of that. Nothing to do with any of that. Nothing. So I'm going to take you to a couple more before I'm finished here. Go with me to the book of, of Matthew 19, because I want you to really get this today. Look at this. We're going to go to uh, Matthew 19. We're looking at character building today. We're getting into character. We're getting into how we think because so many people look and live like they live in a Walmart parking lot. And you know what? It's time to leave. It's time to get up. Mike, Matthew nineteen sixteen. Look at this. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. So people say, Oh, he's a good Christian. Really? Hmm. hmm. You sure? But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Hmm. Keep the commandments. That's it. Now, Jesus has 40 commandments that are separate from the, the Old, Old Testament commandments. But Paul also is the one that tells us much about obedience to God. Romans 2.12. Okay, so Jesus tells us, be, just be obedient. Follow me. Be obedient. It's all good. Look at this. Go to Romans 2. 12. So, 
So, whether you choose to obey God, or whether you choose not to obey God, or even believe Him, or believe in Him, you will be judged. Romans 2, 12. For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. And as many have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. So when you make living by God's laws, God's ways, God's decrees, God's commands, God's statutes, God's precepts, precepts, the way that you live your life, there will be an outcome. On the flip side, choosing not to, there to equally will be an outcome. What's interesting is many, many want to judge those that serve false gods and say they're so wicked and they're so evil, but you know what? They're a lot under themselves doing more righteous works than the people that, that, that sit here reading this word that judge them. The only difference is that they're serving a false god. When they get to serving the, the, the right god, it's incredible what the fruit that comes. So while all the while that they're being judged by the people that should have fruit, that have no fruit, that have this Old and New Testament, judging them because they're serving the wrong God, but yet those people are aligned to themselves, doing more righteous. And when they come to the God, a real God, then, then now you really start to see a whole lot of things shift. So Paul tells us much. It's our choice. To whom will you serve? To whom will you serve? We must start to live for God's purposes. God's purpose. It is about God's purpose and His will for our lives. Period. End of story. I will give you one last scripture for today, and then we'll come back with, the, with more of this next week. We are going to be in uh, Philippians 2. Look at this. Starting in verse uh, 12, 212 of Philippians. Wherefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That is for you to do. Okay. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Notice that his is in italics. Okay. So when you start to see this here, now we can start to be moving to recognize where we're at. Hmm. Interesting, right? So now we say, okay. We're living, one, not separate from God, number one, not hiding from God, number two, and not a will separate. Many are trying to operate, just drag Jesus along and proclaim that it's his, but many on that day will proclaim, God, God, we did this, we did this, we did this, and he'll say, I never knew you. So it's not about the works of what you're doing to make yourself look good. I got 50,000 followers here and I got 4.25 billion over here and everybody likes me because I blah, 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 blah. So what? Okay. And do you know him? We are to be living for his purpose, his will. We were created for his pleasure. When you start to allow this to simmer, marinate within you, and you move outside the, the realms of, of this modernized, placated, self-grandizing religiosity in the fake church today that many may know it as, 
you get out of that and then you begin to see that there's a lifestyle of being and that is one that is being in fellowship it is being in an intimate fellowship relationship with christ it is not about boasting about your works to those that are lacking discernment and easily impressed we're, we're growing beyond that to becoming disciples of christ living for his purpose by his very breath of the holy spirit that indwells within us when we move in this way now you begin to see that it is our responsibility as it's written to work out our salvation with fear and trembling so that we can be moving to be completed in Christ, to be moving to be walking in the fullness of who he calls us to be, to be moving, to be recognizing that it's not just about learning and growing in knowledge. We're not becoming knowledge worshipers and then doing nothing with it. That's a waste of time. We want to be applying, which we're going to be getting into next week. So I pray that as you're going forward, that you're really looking at what what is my relationship with the lord what what is it that i'm desiring what are our relationship goals lord for this year when you start to see that and move in that direction then now you you are living with him not separate it's not like you're living in separate houses or separate bedrooms and you're coexisting you're not coexisting you're existing as one very very different which you which he's in you right so now you start to see the fullness of all of these things come to the fullness within so now you can be getting a corrected thinking that it's not about going it's about being who you are to do what he created you to do on this earth that's where then the rest and the peace of who you are and who he is in you starts to begin to mesh now you are in agreement with you within him within you and that's where where as you move in that direction you will be walking very different than most around you praise god and you'll see very different as well so we're going to camp out there that's that will stop there that's where we're going to close out and we're going to pick this up next week in this series. Like I said, I don't know how many, how this is going to be a long series. It's all I'm going to tell you. It's a long series, praise God, that his book is filled with much for us. So let's pray. Father, I thank you today. I thank you that you're drawing us near to you through the power of your Holy Spirit. Teach us the way, O oh Lord, of walking to walk out our salvation with fear and trembling. Reveal us to us, Lord, and teach us the way of walking in your precepts. Help us, Father, today to be at peace right where we are and content with much and with little. We thank you, Father, today that we, we desire to be walking in the fullness of you, demonstrating to you that we love you by following your commands. So we thank you, Father, that your word is the fullness of instruction for us, for our safety on this earth. We thank you, Father, today for making the way for us. We praise you for these things and we pray them all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. To God be the glory for all of these things in this particular series. I hope that you are enjoying it. And you know, we do pray every single day at the one o'clock Eastern Standard Time, a body of believers that come together and we pray many things and God, God is answering. You may know that there was a, a, a near miss, we may say, with the what, Verano Bridge in New York. We prayed about that before. Then there have been some other ports that, that we were praying regarding the ports and our highways and our byways and we're praying for our leaders and, and we are praying many, many big, bold prayers as we have for over eight years. So I invite you to join us. You can visit Visit us at julieblairministries.org and learn much more about what the mandates are for this ministry, where we are with our land for, for the training center and what God is doing with, with that. It's a big undertaking and I thank God for, for the fact that it will get done. <laughs> He's got to do it. What, what, what am I? I'm just me. I, I, he's got to do it. But there's a lot of exciting things there, as well as just checking us out. There's a lot of blogs and other other things that, that are there for you. So please visit us there. And you know what? If you have a prayer request, you can always post that in the comments below. I'd love to I'd love to read those and then pray for you and see what God does in your life. If you've not yet hit the subscribe button to partner with us, please do. I want to make it say partner, which I might just, you know what? I might just do that. I'm going to learn how to 
we're going to have a new button. It just says partner because we're partners in, in this and, and we're subscribing to the fullness of the gospel, old and new, or the Old Testament and the New Testament. But, but I'm going to change that. So that way it reads accurately what, what it should. And so, but hit the button anyway, regardless of what it is for today. So that way, every message that comes forth, you will, you will receive when it is posted. And so wherever you are getting fed, be a tither. Every ministry has a need. This isn't just a channel. This is a full ministry. We are a 508 faith-based organization and moving in and doing a lot of other things that do cost money. There's, there's no way around that. Every single, every single thing is something that takes time, costs money, and this has been my entire life. And so wherever you are getting fed, just be a good steward with what God's blessed you with. I thank you all for being here and receiving what God had for you today. I look forward to the continuation of this series, and I'll be back soon. God bless you. Bye-bye.